homes in the name of the Lord. Maybe they get it. Father, maybe I don't have to go to the cross to accomplish our purpose. He could have done that, but he didn't. He was very clear that this was just a day. This was the beginning, and in this day he had to be obedient. And while this was a pleasurable day and probably one of the easier days for him to be obedient, that the same obedience he had today on Palm Sunday, he would have to have on Good Friday. Amen? In order to fulfill God's purpose. How many of us? I know I'd fall faint. I know I would. I'd go weak. Sometimes we can't even keep our, our promises to the Lord here on earth. You know, we... So that's what I began to think about. And, and just as, you know, beware of waving fans and to keep your head about you at all times and to do what God has told you to do no matter what it looks like today because people are fickle. It's our nature, unfortunately. And it's, it's a part of our nature that we can beat down and as Paul um, talked about, try to beat into subjection, but it's a part of our nature. And if it had not been, there would have been no need for Jesus in the first place. You know, I think about um, Palm Sunday and this whole week. So I, so I want us to think this week, if we can. Here's my challenge. To think about this week and to act in this week in a way perhaps different than you've ever done before. One of the things, and I think I've mentioned it before um, uh, to the congregation, on the morning prayer line, we had a challenge one week or one month, I can't remember, Ms. Michelle. Oh, ooh, okay. <laughs> we had a challenge for a week. And the challenge was, um, and you know, whatever you say or do, to imagine that Jesus is right there next to you. And really try to keep that front and center in your head. And then we shared um, on Wednesday, which is the day that's kind of a, more of an open day on the line, we shared how that, just that challenge had impacted us. And I shared in one, in one um, situation where I was in the car with Jeremy and he had, he had not done something that I wanted him to do and I just snapped on him. And as soon as I did it, not that you know I didn't need to correct my son, that's not my point, but I snapped on him. And as soon as I did it, the challenge came back to me and I had to turn to him and apologize. And he's, he looked a little confused. <laughs> but the reason was I said, you know what? I'm apologizing because I'm convicted because I know that if Jesus was literally sitting here next to me, I wouldn't have spoken to you like that. I wouldn't have. I might have still corrected you, but I wouldn't have gone off on you. And so that's what that week, we did that week. It kept reminding us, and we were all challenged by things we said, things we thought about people, and, and then the freedom that comes when you allow God in to your thoughts and in to control that tongue and into, into your heart, how you even see people differently. And, and out of that, you react to them differently. So, um, so in the same way this week, my challenge is think about, yes, think about today. And that this was the day seemingly of celebration. But what must Jesus have been thinking on Monday, which was kind of a quiet day? In the, whole, in the scheme of Holy Week, right? It's kind of a quiet day. We don't, we don't read much about it. But was he, you know, he never lost sight of the fact that this might be Monday, but I know Thursday and Friday's coming. What was Tuesday like as he moved closer? Wednesday, Thursday, when he had the Last Supper with his disciples, and he knew there was still one amongst him, among him, amongst him who was going to betray him. And he washed his feet anyway. And then he knew the big one was coming on Friday. And I just saw this as I was sitting here actually meditating on that song. I don't know why we made this. Was it for an event, Bruce, or for Resurrection Sunday? So this is a crown of thorns, right? And th this isn't a serious one. But would any of us want this on our heads? No. I mean, just not even just to, to just lightly put it on my head. 
I can, it prickles my scalp. So you can imagine what a real one felt like slammed in to his scalp, into his head. Amen? Don't want to mess up the do. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. You see, that's how we think, right? <laughs> Jesus was all bloodied up. He wasn't thinking about that. But anyway, so I want us just to think about this week in a different way. Try to be there with him on Thursday. Try to be there with him on Friday. And you know what? I've kind of decided in my head that, um, you know, fr Friday we talk about the, the sorrow and the, the passion of Christ. And part of me is like, now why do we do that? Because really it was a triumphant day. This made the, um, Palm Sunday is seen as the, the triumphal entry, but Friday was really the the triumphant day. It was, that should be the joyous day because that's the day that, you know, he defeated death. And um, I kind of, in my head, I said, we should call it Great Friday instead of Good Friday. Then I thought for a minute, can you imagine, just dealing with us as people, can you imagine for a moment if we kind of skipped over the real intensity, the real drama, the real pain, the real rejection, the real disappointment, physical and emotional pain, drawn out like it was, the humiliation, knowing that at any moment he had the ability to set himself free from that, but that that wasn't what God had called him to do. Can you imagine if we skipped over all of that and went straight to the resurrection? We take him for granted now. Seriously, we take him for granted now. I, I, I admitted um, some time ago that when we were away at the retreat in October, that was the first time that I let myself watch The Passion of the Christ because I had heard already how graphic it was and I didn't want to see it. And in part, I can be perfectly honest and say, because I had my sanitized version based on some old 1950s Charlton Heston movies about what it really looked like. And I had heard how graphic and how close to real uh, Mel Gibson's version was. And there was a part of me that knew that if I saw that, I would have a new level of responsibility. I would have a new call of responsibility. And quite honestly, I wanted to avoid that for as long as I could. I did not want to see what that really looked like. I didn't want to see the depths of his love but you know what? If we don't see the depths of his love, we can't receive the depths of his love. And we'll go on on this surface. Yes, Jesus loves me and I love him. And all. Unless we really get a grip on the depths of his love, then we will walk along in a surface kind of love for him because we won't have any sense, a real true sense of what he did for us. So, um, so then I, I kind of came to, came to peace with that. Like, all right. We need to have, un have an understanding of every step in the process because if we didn't, we would, just, we would just skip over, glorify, we'd be, you know, in our Sunday best, our Easter best or whatever. Sorry, Resurrection Sunday best. Um, <laughs> you know, that's a forbidden word here. <laughs> so we would, um, we would be in our Resurrection Sunday best and just be in a celebratory mood and not have a real sense of the price that we, he paid for that celebration. Amen? All right, so let's just go look here um, at a few verses. I'm gonna give you three verses. You can take them down. Uh, my plan is to get through them all, but I see it's now 1120. Um, Mark 11, one through 10, Zechariah 9, 9, and Psalm 24, seven through 10. I'm gonna read here from Mark 11. Um, all of the gospels have a depiction of um, of his entry. I just want hi to um, highlight some things here in the Mark version. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Emphasis on what? Which no one has ever ridden. Amen? Why was that necessary? 
Why wasn't? Why wouldn't any occult do? Sorry. Pure. But Sarah fulfilled a prophecy. Okay. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you why are you doing this, tell them the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to do, and the people let them go. This is a message for another time, but I want to underscore this. They answered as Jesus had told them to do. How many of us find ourselves in situations where it is clear as a bell? God has spoken to us clearly, and yet we don't answer as he has told us to do. We don't react as he has told us to do. And sometimes we might say, well, he didn't speak specifically to this situation. But in a larger context, he has given us instructions about how to control our tongue. About the fact that a kind word turns away wrath, right? About the fact that it's better to live on the top, what is it, on the top of a tin roof than in the house of a, a, a murmuring, complaining woman. Sarah, I'm not gonna ask why you keep giving these looks, but <laughs> stop now. <laughs> Yeah, most of us do. <laughs> so, um, so when we, you know, when we kind of use that excuse, well, he didn't speak to me in this particular situation. Yeah, stop it. How about the fact that he tells us not to be so easily offended? How about the fact that he tells us when it's possible, as much as it's possible with you, to live in peace? That means you do whatever you have to do to live in peace. And if the other people aren't, <laughs> aren't doing their part. That's on them. You keep following his principles. His principles don't lie. His principles bear fruit. Our own, our own way, newsflash, doesn't. We can get it going. I had a um, conversation with a young lady this week who had come to me about some family stuff, and she was confronted with a very ugly situation with a family member. Family member was um, intoxicated, and you know, kind of sometimes the real self comes out at those times. So family members started accusing her of all kinds of things. And so I'm listening to her, and I'm just kind of waiting for her reaction to all of this, because I know her pretty well. And she said, um, so I said, well, how did you respond to all this? She said, well, you know, I tried to get her back in the car, get her home safely, so and so and so. She said, I was hurt. She said, I was really hurt because if anybody I thought in my family wouldn't hurt me, it would be this individual. And so I said, well, did you ever say anything to her? She said, all I kept saying to myself is I didn't want any regrets. I thought that was so powerful. She said, I just kept saying, if I could hold on to that, I don't want any regrets. And if I open my mouth, there'll be some on both ends. Because she'll escalate, I'll escalate some more, and we'll, we'll go at it. And she said, I had to bite my tongue. When we got home, I had to go into my room and just close the door and say, no, I don't want to talk to you right now. Mm -mm. Sober up, do whatever. She said, but Karen, I just kept holding on to that. I don't want any regrets. How many of us know? How many of us know that when we do what Jesus says, there will be no regrets? That's not to say it's easy. That's not to say there may be times when you walk away and you've got a knot in your stomach because you thought of a few more things you could have said. <laughs> That's not to say you don't feel cheated. That's not to I'm not saying that. But what I've learned, and I'm what, no, what I'm learning is that oftentimes God gives me those situations to find out what's still left in me that needs to be purified. He loves that other person as much as he loves me. It's not like he's on my side 
Like, yep, Karen, mm-hmm, you know, you're the apple of my eye, and that little heathen over there, I don't know what we're gonna do with her. He's, he loves the both of us. And in that same moment, because he's God, he's trying to work in her life as much as he's trying to work in mine. Amen? Do we get that? He's, he's not taking sides. He sees her and he knows her. He knew her when she was in her mother's womb as well. So, uh, that was a digression. Sorry about that, but I think we needed it. So, um, huh? What? Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Mm. More and more of these moments are creeping up on me. Um, when they brought the coat to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So it's not even like they didn't know who he was and why he was there. They knew exactly who he was. They knew, they recognized that. They had the sense to recognize that. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. They understood history. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. How quickly Hosanna turned to crucify him. Um, but yet he kept his focus. He knew all of that. Now we can walk into situations sometimes and we can hold our peace. And that's because we don't know what's coming next. But can you imagine to be just, I want us to get the depth of his love for us. Because his obedience was tied to his love for his father and his love for us. If it was all about him, you know, he could have just been like, Lord, do over, because I'm about to take some people out here. But he kept it. He, kept, he, stepped, he stayed focused. So um, we will see movies this week. We will see. The, the, I was watching the History Channel yesterday. People know I like to watch the History Channel. Um, and it was, you know, kind of hilarious to me. You had all the, you know, the scientists and the archaeologists and the historians, you know, debating and examining and excavating and, you know, trying to explain away certain things. And actually, the, more, the longer I watched, the more amusing it became. Because here we have what we value in this world, or, or what most people value in this world, is men of science. Like science is flawless. It's perfect. You know, all the kinks are out of it. There are no inconsistencies in, in science. And they're just kind of going back and forth with, well, it seems to me this would prove, you know, this is, a, this is a, 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 a fabric that was only used in, you know, such and such a time. This was a, this was a rock that was only found in, you know, certain parts of the country. This was how they would, this was, the, this was the known tradition of that time. It does appear that, ah, but on the other hand, like, really? You know, they're going back and forth, making fools of themselves. But I praise God for that because you know what? There are some people who are in that community, who are in that academic, that scientific community, who aren't going to believe you or me because we don't have the right credentials behind our names. But when they see their own folks going at it, not able to, to reach a conclusion and to, to come to a conclusion, maybe they'll hear it. And so for whatever reason, praise God, that it's getting out there. Um, couple of things, couple more things I just want to um, talk about. So why the cult? Can we turn to Zechariah 9? And then we're going to talk a little bit about why the palms. Zechariah 9.9, 9, Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. So those in that crowd were of what lineage? Many in that crowd came out of what background? Jewish. So... When he came riding in on a colt, they understood, Sarah, that that was a fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. It didn't, it, scripture is so exact. And the details, I mean, 
All we have to do is look if we want them. He rides in on a colt. He could have ridden in on everything. He was coming in as a king. His birth was foretold in the same way, where he would be born, under what circumstances he would be born. So we find the same thing. He began life in humble beginnings. And even as he, even as he was entering his final week here on earth and was coming in, arriving as a recognized king, as a recognized savior, still humble. Humble beginnings, amazing ministry, earth-changing, world-changing ministry. He didn't get caught up in all of that. Like, I should have a kingly robe on. I should have a king. You know, what co colors had great significance. I should be wearing perhaps purple. I should. That wasn't the point. And I think he wants us to understand that so much, too. But that's not the point. That is not the point. The condition of our heart is the point. And can we turn to one more scripture, Psalm 24, 7 through 10. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient gates and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates. Open up ancient gates and let the king of glory enter. Who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven, heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. Let the king enter. Amen? So he's riding into Jerusalem. He is entering the gates of Jerusalem. And again, if you were Jewish in that crowd, you knew it. There was no denying it. But yet, you know, a lot has been written on just kind of like crowd mentality, gang mentality, things that people would never think to do by themselves. They get a false kind of sense of bravery or um, confidence when they're in a crowd. And they can also be swayed. They start to do what I call group thinking. Like, oh, Brother Kingsley's pretty smart, and if he doesn't think this is the king of glory, then I guess it's not. It's like we shut off our brains, and we just start looking to the, oh, well, you know, Brother Scott, I know he's a student of the word. Let me see how he's reacting to this situation. Huh. All right, he doesn't look too enthusiastic about it, so maybe I'll just hedge my, bet, my, uh, hedge my bets and try to you know, wait a little while to try to figure out which way we should go on this. But it was all here, it was all written out for us. Um, so the symbolism, uh, the reality of why the cult, why it was necessary, it was to fulfill prophecy. Why palms? We, we get excited about them now, we wave them, and I don't know that we have any idea why these particular um, branches were chosen. Palms, palms were, had great significance, again, for this occasion. The palms, some say it was because the palms were plentiful in that area, that's true, but I don't think that was the bottom line. The palm branch was the emblem of Judea, and it appeared on the coins of the land, symbolizing one of the country's riches. So in essence, by waving something like a palm, you were waving something that was fit for a king. Got that? All right. Um, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the trees were in bloom, so in covering the way with palm branches, the people were offering a symbol of great value and luxury as befitting a king. To Jews, palm branches represented a gift from God because of their many uses in the people's lives. Palms were so important. I'm just going to cut this short. But palms could be used um, for many things that, you know, there are date palms, of course, that produce dates. Coconut palms that produce coconuts and coconut milk. The sap of a sugar palm was dried, beaten, and ground into very fine sugar. Um, its leaves could be boiled and used as a vegetable. The trunk of the sago palm was ground into flour and made into unleavened bread. Palm trees had almost no waste parts. Their coats their coarse fiber was used to make brooms, mats, and baskets. And how about this? It was even so important, palms were even so important that when countries in that area went to war with each other, they would cut away their enemies' palm branches, causing their enemies to lose what? Food and a very valuable you know, s um, form of sustenance in the midst of a war, in the midst of a conflict. They would cut away the um, palms. Fine bowls and cooking utensils are even made out of palm branches. Um, 
So strewing these palms at the bran at branches at Jesus' feet was a symbol of giving up a world worldly goods and necessities um, and luxuries. The people loved and honored Jesus, and they showed this by lining his pathway with something very important to them. Um, Jesus knew that he, this was, was going to be a very short 24-hour period, and he still had to get a message through to the crowd. So he didn't get sidetracked by all of this. He didn't take part in any celebration for his arrival. He continued to do um, what he was assigned to do. And again, he came into the word on, in, uh, world in humble circumstances, and he was going to go out in humble circumstances. Why? Again, Jesus never took any attention away. Everything was so that what? What would he say? So that his father would be glorified. So he didn't take away, he didn't take time out for like, well, I am going to die in a week, so I could have a little party today. He didn't take time out for that. Because that would, that would bring attention to him, the man, the person, the personality. He stayed the course and did what he was supposed to do, even until death. Amen? So this week, please, my challenge is tomorrow, think about Monday differently. Try to share in his suffering on Monday, even though there's no recording of any physical suffering. But what must he have been thinking? How did he stay focused on, his, on, on what his assignment was? Tuesday, 48 hours from the Last Supper, he was going to have to look the man in the face that he knew was going to betray him. He stayed focused and he washed his feet too. He didn't wash them differently. He didn't sprinkle them and then, you know, give everybody else a good soaking. He washed his feet too. Why? Because he understood that, that, that the task to which he was called to was bigger than this minor distraction. You're off to the side, Judas. I, it's really not about you and it's not about me. He understood that. And as, as his disciples, we talk constantly about how we can be more like Jesus, how we can be more like Jesus. We expect others to be more like Jesus. Well, what does that really look like? I contend it begins with ourselves. It begins with me. As much as I can walk in peace, let me do that. Don't want to have any regrets? Let me hold my tongue. God has asked me to do something, and if I'm clear God has asked me to do it, it's not, you know, delay is disobedience. If he says, Kingsley, pray for Renee, if he wanted you to pray for Renee a week from now, he'd tell you a week from now. Pray for Renee. Pray for each other. Lift this one up. Give this one a phone call. And not to, okay, but to lift each other up. And in that way, fans are fickle. And I, I contend that if we want to be disciples, we want to be more than just fans. Amen? I believe that's what's in everybody's heart. So this isn't a scolding. We want to be more than just fans. Because fans will change based on whether you're winning or you're losing. But a disciple is a disciple is a disciple. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. Honey, you want to come up and do something with the palms? Hmm? You okay? So, you, um, I don't know if you guys can tell. You notice Pastor Wall is trying to creep his way back into church? Mm -hmm. We talk about this at home. Balance. So, because he wasn't expecting, planning to get up here, as I'm, I'm trying to focus, trying to be in the zone before, just before I come up, he says to me, you're going to do something celebratory with the palms? I mean, you're going to have the people wave them, you're going to... I was really like, no, I wasn't thinking about that, but okay, if you want me to, right? And I got all the way to the end, and I forgot to. So, dear, if you want me to, or you want to do something. It's also scary.
And we're just going to sing as we prepare for our communion. And while we're singing, we are going to just wave these palms. And we're going to celebrate who Jesus Christ is. And we're celebrating what Jesus Christ did for us. Amen? Amen. Let's go back and sing that song as the elders and deacons are preparing the communion. Let's sing the song that we sang, Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify the Lord, for he is worthy to be praised. Oh, magnify, oh, magnify the Lord. You can go ahead and prepare. For he is worthy to be Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. Blessed be the rock of my salvation. I wish I had a movie camera to show some of you. Hosanna. Blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Amen. You may be seated. Now, as we prepare for our communion when service is over, if you would like to take some of the palms with you, some additional palms, and give them to friends and to tell them what the palms mean. We learned about that this morning. Why don't you use the palm as an opportunity to engage in a conversation with a neighbor, a family member, or a friend about Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 23. Let me read it. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and we, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For wherever you eat and, and drink this cup, uh, eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so that's what we're doing. We're proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. We're remembering what Jesus did for us. Now let's pause and just pray. And if there's some areas of our lives where we want to say, God, I just want you to forgive me for areas of my life where I have walked away from what it is that you're calling me to do. If there's some strife in your life and you want to just seek God's forgiveness, why don't we confess to him, talk with him before we come to this table and partake of the communion. And when Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can never in this world, give me Jesus, in Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus. A man ought to examine himself before he eats 
of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number have fallen asleep. But if we judged, if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Amen. Let us repeat the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'm alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, you can have all this world, give me In the morning when I rise, 
Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. Thank you, Jeremy. You hold in your hand the symbol that represents the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and you hold in your hand the other symbol that represents the, the blood. Jesus said, as often as you do this, remember him. So let's do that right now. And the symbol that represents his shed blood. Thanking Jesus for fulfilling prophecy. And let's all stand as we just prepare ourselves to depart. I want to thank you for coming out today. I want to thank you for struggling as members of the body of Christ for us to be a family, the body becoming a family. And I pray that as we share with people about what happened today, that they will catch a sense of what could happen on next Sunday at Resurrection Sunday as we reach out to brothers and sisters and encourage them to make a decision for Jesus Christ and then to come and be a part of our church family. We're going to pray. If you have any prayer needs or you want to be prayed for before you depart, feel free to come up to the front of the church and the deacons and elders will pray for you and with you. If you're here and you do not know Jesus as your Savior and Lord and you want to make that decision today, come forward and we'll sit down and talk with you about how you can walk from where you are into a relationship with God through the person of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the taught word tonight, today. Thank you for the teaching. We thank you for the clarity of the teaching. And we thank you for the anointing. And Father, we thank you so, so much that you have given us life and that much more abundantly. And Jesus, I thank you that you are the way, the truth, and the life, that through you we can have a relationship with the Father. And so we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ today in preparation for the celebration on next Sunday. We thank you, Jesus, for not being disobedient to the vision, to the call, to the prophecy. And Father, I pray that as we leave here today, that you will continue to speak to us about growing up in our faith.